Welcome to the Foundations class. We're just going to keep uh, talking on this, I don't know, this series, I guess I'm calling, you know, uh, God Doesn't Color Outside the Lines or whatever, so we're going to keep looking at, at that. So we want to welcome you watching by video. Again, we'd love the interaction, so if you'd like to send us an email at foundations at lifeoffaithchurch.org, we'd be glad to talk to you and respond to you that way. And as always here in the class, please uh, don't hesitate to jump in and uh, share what God's uh, speaking into your heart. So Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us this morning and teach us uh, together in Jesus' name. Amen. So go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We didn't do this last week, and I probably should have, but we want to kind of look at some text passages, some kind of anchor passages for this, this lesson or this class. So in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and just as a real aside, as a novelty, you know, it's a fun thing to kind of go through Scripture and look at the three sixteens. If you've never done that before, it's just pretty, it's pretty neat. So just throw it out there for, for fun homework. You can go look through the three sixteens uh, and see what says. So anyway, um, so set, there's nothing deeply spiritual about that. So nobody, <laughs> there's no numerology, there's no deep, it's just the rabbits that run through my crazy brain. So there we go. Um, so 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So how much Scripture was given to us? All. All. And let's look at this again. And what was it given for? This is a great, what I call a hinge pin verse for us as New Testament believers. Okay, this is, this, is a, this is a verse that our life will hinge on. All scripture has been given by the inspiration of God. I think we said this in one of our last classes. That word inspiration really means God breathed. So every verse was blown out of the mouth of God. God breathed it. So when you're reading scripture, and if I can jump in here, because we're talking about this, and I think this is kind of what happens to us sometimes, is how to help me Holy Ghost say this well, okay? So everybody, uh, we become quite familiar with what is common. Do we understand that? You know, when something's common, we bec it, it can become very familiar to us, and you can inadvertently... Uh, man, now I'm just speaking in Spanish in my head. You can inadvertently, menos preciar, you can um, take, it, uh, take advantage of it, if that makes sense, or, or forget what it is. Does that make sense? Am I saying, so many people look at me kind of like uh, funny, you know, it, it's, um, it's like scripture, right? How many of you have more than one Bible at home? Come on, be honest. How many of you are like me, you got a whole shelf of them? You know what I mean? And, and how many of you, you grew up with more than one Bible? You know, for us, you know, Bibles and the Word of God, it's a great thing, but it is, for us, it's quite common, right? You can get them anywhere, you can get them on devices, you can get them in hardback, computer, uh, you know, there's blueletterbible.org, there's biblegateway.com, I mean, I'm sure there's probably a bajillion other uh, internet way, I mean, just the Word of God, praise His name, is out there in abundance, but because of that, sometimes scripture itself can seem common. But it'd be kind of like, not exactly, but kind of sort of like the old saying, familiarity breeds contempt. Very good, Chris. Yeah, that's exactly. That phrase, familiarity, will breed contempt, is a great way in the sense that we can think. Because, because we have the Bible so readily in our lives, if we're not careful, sometimes the Bible itself is just common. Because, I mean, I'm sure all of us that have grown up, we've heard uh, people say, and hopefully not too many times ourselves say, oh, yeah, I know that, right? Yeah. You know, somebody throws out there, you know, well, let's go to John 3.16. Oh, yeah, 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 I, I know that. Yeah, I, I got it. Well, this is, what this, this is what Paul is saying to Timothy. All Scripture, every script, every verse, every book, every chapter is literally the breath of God. You hold the voice of God in your hand. Does that make sense? So every time you open this book, it is God speaking to you. And, it's, and, it's, and if I could be honest, it's, it's more certain 
than the still small voice. Okay, now that's why I got a wow. <laughs> See, that's what I'm talking about. Do y'all, do y'all realize that? Right. Now, now, please hear me. I got to make sure I'm clear. I'm, I'm not bashing on the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Everybody shake your head and make sure you understood Brad. Say, everybody say, Brad said, Brad he's, said. Not he's not bashing the voice, the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm not. Okay, so please hear me when I say that. When I sit there and say, but the word of God written is more certain than the still small voice. Does that make sense? And, and, and how loving is our Father that He gave us an anchor for our soul so that when we stand back and go, man, was that God or was that pizza? <laughs> right? Because how many of you, and nobody else besides that, how many of you asked, oh, Lord, was that you? <laughs> have you ever said, I just don't, was that, was that you, God? I don't know. Was that... Ah, Right? Anybody else besides me been there? This is how you know. Because the Holy Spirit in the still small voice, in the authoritative inner voice as I call it, and even on an external voice if you hear it audibly with your ears, will never depart from what is written here. And we're going to look at that in just a minute to make sure. So this is what we're talking about, about again, living in this proverbial, I don't like the word, but I can't think of a better one right now, living in this balance between the written principles of Scripture and the leading of the Spirit. Living in these things is what we're trying to discuss in this class. But all Scripture is the voice of God. All Scripture, it, so when you open, it, it, this is more authoritative, real, certain, powerful, um, trustworthy, faithful than anything we might hear in the still small voice. We all agree with that, right? So again, I just want to make sure that's clear because the reason why I say that's common is because sometimes if we're not careful, we're looking for the voice of the Spirit and we will bypass or we will... Um, Again, we will put down, if you will. I can't think of a better word. I can think of this word in Spanish because it's such a juicy word. You've got to learn Spanish. It's a great, you know, <laughs> it, it, and, um, you know, we will not as value as highly what we read because it's just so common to us. Does that make sense? But all scripture is given by the breath of God and is profitable for, now notice, if you haven't done this, you can underline it, for these four things. Okay, here's what, Scripture is going to do for us. You're going to, this morning we're going, to call, we're going to look at Scripture's job description and we're going to look at the Holy Spirit's job description. How many of you have a job or have had a job at some point in your life? Very good. How many of you know the, the, the whoever uh, came up and said, here you go, Miss Gail, here is your job description. This is going to line out what you're going to do in this position, right? And so this is Scripture's job description. Position. This is what it does. It teaches us. That's the word doctrine. If I can throw that out there, don't go hating on certain words, okay? I know in, in certain things we have made religion out of things, but this we're not talking religion. All doctrine means is teach or teaching. So it is profitable to teach us, okay? Then it says for reproof, okay? How many of you like that word? It's okay. <laughs> I like being honest, Miss Bell. That's awesome. Well, I mean, we, we normally, I mean, we love that first one, right? Yeah, amen. The, the word teaches us. And then, oh, that doesn't sound very grace filled, right? It reproves us. Okay. Then it says it corrects us. And then it says in the last one, and it instructs us. And actually, the word there in the Greek language is the word it disciplines us. So you actually see something here, and if I can talk about it, it's reproof, correction, and discipline. This is the pathway of instruction. These four things are, it teaches us. So it's going to tell us things that maybe we didn't know before. Or maybe we didn't know the way fully. It's going to teach us. Then reproof, if you think of it like this, uh, we, we talked about this with our children around the table this last week as, as we were studying and preparing for this. It's kind of like when, when I discipline and, and, and prepare my children. 
I sit them down and say, okay, I'm going to teach you what, needs to be, what you need to know. And then I'm going to turn you loose, right, and let you go. And when you go up there, and how many of you are you going to make a mistake? I mean, if, you, if you've got children of any flavor in your life, okay, if I can just throw that, they're going to mess up, okay? Selena and I are trying to really learn to quit being perfectionists, okay? They're going to mess up. They're, they're just, it's going to happen. So here's the pathway. You teach them. When they make that first mistake, you reprove them. Remember what I told you. Remember I told you this is what this is. This is how this works, whatever that is. It's a reproof. We could say it's a reminder of what was first taught to you. Well, then how many of you know you kind of rock along and you don't always get it on the first reminder? Or you, you kind of, you do, you, you, and you go and you make another mistake. Well, then there's a correction that comes in place, right? Yes. There's a correction that is exhibited. Hey, okay, and you're, you're correcting that situation, whatever that means. Okay, and then finally there's discipline. Now, discipline is in place when it's kind of like you stomp your little foot and you say, no, I'm not doing it, Right? Again, for the parenting people, and you can pass it on. You want to instruct parents that we train childishness, but we discipline defiance. Okay? We train childishness, but we discipline defiance. And so this is kind of this, that's what that last word means, is when we say, no, God, I know what it says. I know what you want me to do, and I'm just not going to do it. God will lovingly discipline you. In grace. I don't look at me in that tone of voice. Are you with me? All right? Okay, we don't have time in this lesson to go into what that is. I don't, and that just to make sure I'm clear, that, that doesn't mean God gives you a dose of some sickness. It doesn't mean God, you know, kills the cat and bankrupt, bankrupts your business. No. You know, <laughs> does that make sense? We're not talking about that. That's not the discipline of the Lord. Okay, many times that's the stupidity of me. <laughs> right? <laughs> I did that to me. God didn't do that to me. I can, many times I can't even blame the devil. The devil didn't even do that to me. I, I did that to me. I did it to myself. You know. So anyway, did you see this though? But this is what Scripture does. Scripture teaches us. It reproves us. Gives us that reminder. Hey, no, no, no. It corrects us. Not that. This. And then Scripture disciplines us. Right? Scripture is the rod that'll tell us, and if we can talk, that'll tell us things. If you keep doing that, this will be what happens. You know what I mean? If you keep this, will and when it happens, we don't go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You told me that would happen. Does that make? But that's what Scripture does. Hallelujah! And this is a good thing. This is what God's speaking. So when you're going to Scripture, this is what's happening in our life. Remember, we talked about these areas that we're using as like a canvas that God's going to now paint the picture of our life on. So in finances, Scripture will teach us, it'll reprove us, it'll correct us, and it will discipline us in that area. Does that make sense? So that we will be complete, which means mature, Thoroughly equipped for every work. That's the reason why scripture does this. For our good. That it would mature us and that it would equip us so that we're ready for every good work God puts in front of us. Is that, everybody doing all right this morning? Yeah. James, you got Yeah. <laughs> well, it's kind of one of those things that, you know, it's, it's, we call it when we talk about with our children again, raising our children, that there many times the best discipline is the natural consequence of things. If you do this, this is probably what's going to happen. And then you just let them, you know, like we just, you know, the, the, for example, you know, like, the girls, you know, they just started their own little business here, their first little business, and they're selling 
chocolate covered frozen bananas at the local farmer's market in Gardendale on Thursday. And they're doing really good. So the little, little gaffers made about 60 bucks last Thursday. You know what I mean? So they're doing good. So we went to the Caribbean festival yesterday that was downtown and they pretty much, you know, just blew all their money. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and they did, you know, and so, you know, and trying to teach them, say, we want us, and, and we're doing, we're teaching, okay, you, you, here's your tithe, here's what we give, Here, you need to save, what are you saving for, and okay, and here's your spend money. Well, they liquidated both the save and the spend, you know, they, and, and, and even on the right, you know, right here this morning, Sandy goes, hey, I'm, I'm almost out of money. I said, man, that happens when you spend all of it. You know what I mean? You got to go back to work. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, praise God, we'll have next Thursday. You see what, so there's discipline that comes through life that many times, again, as a loving parent, I don't want to spare them from. Does that make sense? I don't want to rescue them from, you know, we, we always say it like this, boo-boos are a part of life. And I will not save you from the boo-boos because the boo-boos will teach you things that if I tried to teach them, it would just like I, look like I was mad all the time. Mm-hmm. Or if you mm-hmm. rescued them every time, they wouldn't know the yes. response that God wants them to make. Exactly right. They, they wouldn't know the response that's right. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Do you, do you, does this make sense? This is what Scripture does for us, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. This is what Scripture teaches us. It reproves us. It corrects us. It disciplines us. That's an awesome thing. Praise God. It's a wonderful thing. You know, the, again, you said, Solomon said in the Proverbs, remember, we hug the neck of the one who corrects us. Right? That's, I mean, that's not necessarily a natural response, especially if we haven't been trained that way. But Scripture says that's how much we are to value correction, how much we are to value instruction is that when someone comes to me and says, hey, Brad, I've been noticing this and this and that and the other, and, hey, you know, you know the Scripture says this or whatever, and, you know, you, you might want to look at that. The Bible says my response is, is to hug that person. Say, brother, sister, thank you. I didn't know that. That's or, or, hey, oh, you know, I knew that, but I just, <laughs> I just really didn't want to. <laughs> you know, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, now, you're looking at me kind of funny. Let's move on. John, chapter 14, right? That's the job description of scripture and again if I can say it scripture is a more sure word of God than anything else not again not poo-pooing the voice of the spirit because you know God speaks to us in two if you will make sure I say this well I don't want to get confused God speaks to us in two avenues it's his same voice but he speaks to us through two primary avenues The number one primary avenue is this word. And then the second primary avenue is through the voice of the Spirit on the inside. As Paul said in Romans, that inner witness that comes. Paul says, you know, that my spirit bears witness with the Holy Spirit that I'm a child of God. So it's that, it's our spirit bearing witness with the Holy, that inner witness, that, again, still small voice, uh, Jiminy Cricket, whatever you want to call it, that inside voice that's there is also how God talks to us but it's the secondary voice of God the primary way is right here does that make sense and the reason why is this is because church God's just not vague you know God's not a smoke and mirrors kind of dude does that (laughs) Y'all look at me kind of funny here now. Do you you understand that? God is not vague. He is crystal clear. That's what he wants. Because again, whose will does he want done on the earth? His will. So whose will is it? His. So whose responsibility is to communicate to me his will? How many of you know he, he really wants me to know what that is? Now, now, bless his heart, he's working with me. Okay? He's not vague, but sometimes either I can be obstinate, okay? Which means what obstinate means, right? 
Israelites were called stiff-necked people. In, in Spanish, it, the word talks about how it is to lead a donkey sometimes. You ever tried to lead a, a, a little burro? Sometimes they sit on their butt and stiffen their neck, and you need a bulldozer. And that's about the only way you're going to get that little donkey to move, because he ain't going nowhere. So either sometimes I'm like the little donkey, right? Or most of the time, I'm just human, and I've got my own doubts, my own securities, my own failings, my own whatevers, and I, and I go, ah, I, it, what I don't, is again, is that God, is that pizza, what was that, I I don't know, man, it just seemed, and God said, I love you so much, and I want this to be so clear to you that I'm going to preserve my will in written form for thousands of years, three continents, six language, over how many, 40-something different authors, I'm going to hold on to it, preserve it, keep it, and pass it on faithfully through the blood of martyrs and saints, so you'll clearly know what in the world I want you to do. So again, just if, and, and we, I'd love to teach it sometimes, but if we don't get a chance to, you need to study the history of the book you hold in your hand. Because just knowing the history of how this book got to you will totally sit there and say, God, you really are talking to me. Because <laughs> this thing has been preserved and passed on and is just as accurate. Do you understand that? It, again, I mean, just for, for time's sake. I mean, how am I doing on time? Is this all right this morning? It, it, it's kind of like this. You know how they, just from a, we're going to kind of, just for a second, spiritual side of Scripture, we're going to put off over here. We're not going to negate it or deny it, but I'm just going to talk historically for a moment. Do you know how they guarantee that a book that is old, that is historical, is accurate? Anybody know the math that they do as historians? No? Uh huh. How much time elapsed from when the event Exactly. So how how much time from when whatever was written to our earliest copy? Does that make sense? And then they go, how many copies do we have? Right? How many ever did you watch Brad Pitt's movie Troy? Anybody see that movie years ago? Nobody saw that. Ever heard of a man named Homer? And he wrote a book called The Iliad, another book called The Odyssey, right? You know, that, that roughly between the time, supposedly, that Homer wrote this and the first known copy is over a thousand years. And if I'm remembering right, we have a few hundred copies. So they say, with that kind of a math, we're pretty certain that when you run down here to Barnes & Noble and you buy a copy of Homer's Iliad or Homer's, it's, it's what he wrote. Because it's just a thousand years. We have about 300, 400 copies. Does that make sense? Do you know the New Testament? It's about 100 years, 120 years between the originals and our earliest copy. And we have over 5,000 full manuscripts or partial manuscripts of just the New Testament. There is no other book in history that has that much historical authenticity behind it, behind, besides the book you hold in your hand. Just as an ancient writing goes. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And that's just the Greek stuff. We're not talking about the Coptic stuff or the Syrian stuff or the other things that were written. We're not talking about the fact that from the early church fathers like Polycarp and those men who were the direct disciples of the original 12 men that came out, the fact that you can take their writings alone and put together the entire New Testament minus 11 verses. The, then we're not even talking about what happened after the Reformation when men literally gave their life to accurately translate it from the original documents and put it into German, put it into Spanish, put it into English. Does that make sense? In the history of men like Wycliffe, who literally gave up his entire life to finally produce the English Bible we hold in our hand. Not even that in the fact of that our beloved King James Version wouldn't even have been a version of the Bible that a good Protestant would have held on to at that time. Did you know that? 
Amen. That the, the Protestants of old would not have been caught dead with a King James Bible because they, they thought it was the Catholic version of the Scripture. Because King James was a Catholic and he was trying to stem the tide of all this stuff going on. So he had an authorized, true, now please hear me, true version written of the Bible. In the, so even when the devil tried to do something against it, remember what Paul said about that? Remember when Paul said, hey, there's some who are out there preaching this gospel in the hopes that it's going to cause more trouble for me? I'm just so glad they're out there preaching, because the, apparently they were preaching the gospel. So the same, so King James was trying to thwart something that was going on, so he produces a, a it was accurate, good version of the scripture. <laughs> and you and I hold it in our hand, I hold the new King James version right here. Are you with me? You just look at the history of what you hold in your hand and you see God all over the preservation of this book so that you and I would clearly know exactly what his will is. How faithful is that? Because God knew that we would have our days when we would wonder if it was him or if it was pizza. So he said, well, here, just so you know, and to make those times clear, here. Here. How loving is our Father? Yeah. Amen? Now, is that all right? Sorry. Yeah. I, I digress. John chapter 14. And here, let's look at this. Verse 16. And it says, we'll back up. Verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Can I just pause here real quick, okay? And please hear me. In, now, this is Jesus, right? So Jesus is full of grace and truth john in the same book said in the very first chapter so this verse is written full of grace and truth okay so we're not talking about anything else but we can't say i love you to god without obedience does that make sense we we don't we don't express love to god apart from obedience it's impossible You know, Jesus didn't say, if you love me, you're going to have that warm, fuzzy feeling. You know, <laughs> you, you, you know you, you're going to be like that song, you know, you've lost that love and feeling, right? I mean, no, it's, <laughs> no, if you love me, Jesus says, that love you have for me is going to inspire obedience. It's going to motivate you to obey. Hallelujah. So obedience is full of grace. Grace isn't a way for us to get away from obedience. It's the doorway and the power to actually now obey. I tell people all the time, grace didn't free me from obedience. Grace empowered me to obey. Now finally, because of grace, I can obey. Before, like Paul said in Romans 7, before when I was under the law, the very thing I wanted to do, I didn't do it. And the very thing I didn't want to do, that's the very thing I did. Yeah. And Paul said, oh, what a wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And he says, thanks be unto God, it was Jesus Christ. Well, what was Paul talking about there? Man, I, I, I want to do what God wants me to do, but I don't have the ability to do it without Christ. But now because of Christ... There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because now I can do it. Hallelujah. Y'all look at me funny. Does that make sense? I say that because as we read through Scripture, you have to understand that because you're going to read some things and you might think, I can't do that. I've never done that before. I've never ever seen anybody ever do that before. Does God know how messed up my family tree is? Right? And he goes, yeah. But now you can. Because of grace, now you can. Okay, y'all look at me kind of funny this morning. All right, all right. All right, John, it says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give another helper. And again, that word means one just like me. That he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. 
praise God. Here's the promise of the Father, as was later explained by Jesus in Acts, that we will have God's Spirit forever living in us when we are born again. Amen. Y'all with me? Yes. And do we remember that? And do you understand that? That there is what we call at times a dual working of the Spirit in the life of the believer. Now, please hear me. I'm not talking about two separate spirits. Same Holy Spirit, two works of the Spirit in the life of the believer. What we're looking at and going to look like in John chapter 14, 15, and 16 is the work of the Spirit within the believer through the new birth. He will be the Spirit within us. Amen. So this is for every person. Doesn't matter their denomination. Doesn't matter their shingle they hang over their head. If they have truly accepted Christ and his substitutionary work on the cross, they've accepted what he's done for them, I mean, ever to whatever degree they are, right? Because aren't you, aren't you glad God just, just takes you? Yes. Amen. Yes. You know, aren't you glad that the prayer of salvation is Lord? Yes. <laughs> right? That's what, he who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's right. Hallelujah. So we're talking about all people. This is what's for every true, genuine, born-again believer is what we're about to read. The Spirit lives within them. But there is also the work of the Spirit upon the believer. As we see in Luke, as we see in Acts, where the Spirit comes upon the believer for the equipping and the empowering of service and the ministry of reconciliation. Am I, am I doing all right? Tracking okay with me? Okay. So you have to understand that, that, the, that, the, that the bab, what we call the baptism of the Spirit is for external service, right? The indwelling of the Spirit through the new birth is for daily living. Jesus talked about it in two watering things. He says, He will be a fountain to you, and He will be a river to you. Well, in that culture, again, a fountain was something that was in the courtyard of your home. It was for your family's use. A river was public access. It watered everything. So the Spirit would be a fountain on the inside bringing things for the individual and for that person, and then he would be like a river coming out of that person to water the world that was dry. That's the Spirit within and the Spirit upon. So what we're reading in John 14 is what's going to be in every believer and for every believer that truly believes. By tracking all right. This not, not new information for anybody. I'm looking because I'm getting some, as Brother Hagin used to say, I'm getting some cows at a new gate look. Everybody's kind of got big eyes and blinking real hard. Am I all right? Okay. Now let's keep going. Where does it jump? Down to verse 25. These things I've spoken to you while present with you, but the helper, so this is the same one. So I love the way Jesus, look at the way Jesus does this. He starts out by saying the Spirit's going to come and he's going to live in you. And he's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. You won't be an orphan. You'll never be without him. He's not going to take a vacation. He's literally 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, all holidays, everything. He's going to be right there. Praise God. Amen. It says, now the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, notice what he's going to do. He will teach you all things. This is reminiscent of what John is going to say in his first epistle in chapter 2. You have an unction from the Holy One in anointing and you know all things. You have no need that anyone teach you for the unction, the Spirit on the inside of you will teach you all things. So the very first thing the Holy Spirit is going to do for you and I is He's going to teach us all things. Hallelujah. He's going to show you. He's going to teach you this, but Lotus, he says, and bring to your remembrance the things that I have said to you. Notice how he ties those two things together. So the Holy Spirit is going to teach you all things, and where is he going to get the information to teach you the all things? From all the things that I have spoken to you. How much scripture has been spoken by the voice of God? That's what Paul says in Timothy. All scripture is spoken. It's God breathed by the breath of God. So the very first job of the Holy Spirit is he's going to come into the breath of God. He's going to come into all things spoken to us and he's going to pull out of all things spoken to us and teach us all things. Does that make sense? 
So when we talk about these little areas of our life, like our finances, where do you think he's going to teach you from? When we talk about things about marriage and family relationships, where do you think he's going to teach you from? When we talk about things about your career and your job, not so much what it is, but how you're supposed to live on it, you're going to, do you see this? When he teaches you about how to behave yourself in the house of God, where does he think he's going to go? What other things can we talk about, right? When he talks about, I mean, I'm looking around the room, when he talks about grandparenting, where do you think he's going to go? He's going to teach you all things about all areas of your life, and he's going to bring it all from these scriptures. And he's going to teach you all things and remind you the things that he has said. Praise God. Yeah. Now let's stop and meditate on that. Now look at me. What's your thoughts? It'll be a long morning. <laughs> Mm-hmm. There's no situation he doesn't know and answer for. Absolutely. And so to lean and trust on him, it should keep you at peace. Yes. And it should keep you not being anxious. Mm-hmm. And that kind of thing, because he's always going to guide you to whatever that situation is. I mean, if they have something that nobody else probably has, or so he knows the answer. Yes. And, and so I should just trust him and allow him to keep you at peace joyfully. Well, read the next verse, Miss Wendy, verse 27. I don't leave you the way you're used to being left, feeling abandoned. There is. So don't be upset. Don't be distressed. Yeah. So he said, and again, it says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. So do you understand? So just what you're saying is exactly right. See, following the voice and the teaching of the Spirit from the pages of Scripture is the fountain of peace. Does that make sense? Yes. That it is the source of peace. Let peace be your and let peace be your umpire. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right there in Romans. Let peace be the umpire ruling in your heart. I like what Brother Joseph Prince says when he talks about peace is the believer's natural habitat. We live in peace. That's our natural environment. And that's why when we step outside and we don't have peace, normally what you find is, is in some way you've stepped outside what's been written in here. Now, I like what you just said something, Wendy, and it sparked, you know, you understand that this is the kingdom that you hold in your hand, this book. Does that make sense? This is the written book of the kingdom. Amen. This is what the kingdom looks like. This is what it is. It's inside. Of, and if I can help in, in, I mean, man, every time you open this book, you are looking into who you are and what the kingdom is. It, it, it's a spiritual experience. Does that make sense? It's a spirit. It is God literally speaking and talking to you. Yes, sir. The biggest revelation to me in the last year, year and a half has been the one about love that's unconditional. Absolutely. And there ain't nothing we can do about it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Number two, he says, as Jesus is, so am I in mm-hmm. the Lord. And I saw this, I read this in, in my studies this year. Yes. With my skin. That's exactly right. That's exactly. And, and, and so I like what you said. And where did you learn that? From the Word. From the Word. That walk among us. That, do you understand? See, that, that's what this, it's a, again, Hebrews, the writer in Hebrews says it's a living thing. This book is a living thing. It's, it's alive. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the only implement on planet Earth that's able to divide between the soulish and the spiritual. It's the only implement that divides between the thoughts and the intents of the heart. 
It's the only thing. Uh oh, there's the duck. Duck got us. Is, that, is, is this book? I mean, let's just keep reading real quick. I have a few minutes and let's look at this because you can study this more in chapter 15, verse 26. But when the Helper, again, the Holy Spirit, comes, whom I send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from me, he will testify of me. Notice that, that the Spirit is going to testify of Jesus. Everything Jesus is, everything Jesus did, how that affects you and applies to you, right? I mean, again, that, that's why, we, again, we know there's no condemnation in Christ because the Holy Spirit is not going to be pulling up your old dirty laundry. How many of you used to be like, I mean, we all come from charismania, right? <laughs> you know, and, and, and brother or sister so-and-so, and you can put whoever's name out there you want to because there's so many, right? And they're the prophet, you know, which is true. Please, okay, but everybody got to make sure you get all these qualifiers. They are totally our prophets today, and I believe in that. I think they are. But what shouldn't happen is, is we come to, and oh, I got to make sure everything's good because I don't want them to read my mail, right? Which normally we have said means what? Means God's going to take whatever it is I feel like I did or didn't do or should have done or whatever, my mistake, and he's going to pull it out in front of God and everybody through the prophet. And the prophet's going to look at you and they're going to know everything about you and they're going to tell it to everybody. And so basically we say that the prophet and his gift is basically he's the spiritual gossip. <laughs> when he does it that way. Does that make sense? No, no, that the Holy Spirit, when he talks about things, he testifies of Christ. He doesn't testify of you. See, the voice of the Spirit sounds just like, this is what Jesus did for you. This is how he sees you. This is who you are in him. This is what he's doing and wants to do in you. This is your future in him. He didn't go meddling up in whatever might have just happened yesterday. Amen. Amen. He'll deal with you on your own about that stuff. Does that make sense? Amen. Y'all with me here? It says there, and also bear witness... Because you have been with me from the beginning. And also you will bear witness. He says, and, and in that, what he's talking specifically to the 12, talking about that then the Spirit will help them to testify of Christ. So they're gonna, they're, he's going to testify to us of Jesus, and then we're going to take that testimony of the Spirit and go testify to somebody else. Do you see that? So he helps us to testify of Christ. Now in chapter 16, where is that? Verse 13. And we'll end with this one. I believe that's the last one that's there. Somebody correct me and we'll do it next week if it's not. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Now there's two things here. He's going to guide you into truth, right? How much truth? Where do you think that truth is going to originate from? All truth. He's going to tell you all truth. That's why, again, do you see, trying to build this establishment with us here. Because as the Holy Spirit leads us and he guides us individually, which he is going to do, it will be anchored back into this. Amen. And of all the things we've seen, the only one that says, and he will tell you things to come. That's that prophetic piece. He's going to show you things about your life that are yet to come. He's going to show you things into the future. And so we should expect that spiritual part to happen as well. He's going to show us, give us glimpses of where he's leading us and guiding us to be. But most of what he's doing in our life is anchored back to this book. Teaching us all things. Guiding us into all truth. Reminding us of what God has said. Taking from what, even in that last verse, is he's not going to speak on his own authority, but he's going to speak only what he has heard. Amen. Does that make sense? How powerful is it for us that we walk around with these two ways God talks to us? The secure anchor of our soul, the written word of God, so that when it's fuzzy to us, we can make it real clear. And then the power of the leading of the Spirit of God that will take from this and it, blow it up and expound it 
in our minds and, our, and take us into things that we didn't see on our own out of here, but it's still out of here. Does that make sense? And then as he leads us into the future, we've got this whole big steamroller of power from the will of God moving us forward into the things that he's showing us that are yet to come. Does that make sense? That's why we're talking about that. So that's why as we continue maybe in the next couple of weeks, we want to look at some of this stuff to realize God's going to paint our life from here and make it. It'll be ours. It'll be unique, but it's going to look. That's why, again, it's going to look like this. Again, and I'll close with this last slide. It's, I think it was Eric and I were talking about this. You know, it was, we're all unique individuals, but we should all look like Christians. It says, it says, it says in Acts that they were first called Christians in Antioch. And it wasn't the Christians who called themselves Christians. It was the world that called them Christians because that word means little Christs. Does that make sense? So see, we are living our life. I love, and then we're talking, what the early church called themselves, they said, we are the way. We live in his way. We are the way. We do things God's way. We live his way. We are the way. That's what they called themselves. But when they had that attitude of I'm living the way, the world saw them as Christ when they lived the way. Does that make sense? So that's what we're talking about. So that's why when people look at us, they can say, yeah, man, I can see the individuality, of, but they're, they're, yeah, they're a little Christ. Yeah, that's who they are. 